Well, as uh, Marie and I were chit-chatting early, it's brisk out there. So welcome to a uh, fall day in Florida, our first of the year, November 1st. And uh, we have our first fall day. Uh, happy Monday to everybody. I'm going to begin today by just showing you a couple of uh, field guides. I have three field guides here, uh, very short field guides, and they're not... Uh, they're more for naturalists than scientific guides. Scientific guides, if you will, tend to be the, the Peterson field guides. They're a lot more complex. And then they have the slides in there. Uh, this week, or this, this unit, you have a field guide to uh, design and uh, submit as one of your um, assignments. So, uh, I'd like to show you setup of some simple field guides because I really don't need a uh, complex scientific field guide. This would be for uh, more of a naturalist uh, for the marine biology section. So uh, this one is the guide to Florida seashells. You can see there's a nice cover. When you enter it, uh, it has an introduction, introduction here, and the different types of shells that you would find, the gastropods, cephalopods, scaphopods, bivalves. Scaphopods, very rare, uh, but we're looking at the gastropods and bivalves, bivalves on our uh, beach. And of course, they have a little background on uh, Florida, and they even have a little page on anatomy. Then they get in with the ID they have an image, the description, and a little bit about its range. They have the scientific name as well. So this is the Florida's Guide to Seashells. Florida's fishes, uh, similar. They don't, they don't have as uh, detailed an introduction, only a page about the author and a page uh, on fishes itself, but they do have nice image of each name, description. Uh, they also have the scientific name. So this one's set up very nicely. Uh, they have two per page, you can see. That's a real nice setup for a student because you could have the image, the scientific name, the common name, and the information below it and have two per page. Uh, another one, Sport Fish of the Gulf, nice detailed introduction. And they have one per page with a lot more information. So I just wanted to show you the, oh, by the way, the Florida guide has a little bit about it on the back. Uh, I like the way the, the field guide for the fish are set up for its simplicity but you would want to add a little more detail in your field guide for the introduction. And what the heck am I blathering about, you might think? Let's take a look at the assignment associated with marine biology, uh, designing a field guide. So this will be due next Wednesday, and you will make a field guide for the identification of common shells found in the Tampa Bay area. You go to the beach, I go to the beach, everyone here is probably goes to the beach every now and again at the very least, and you see shells littering the beach. Those are our local shells. And the goal here is to learn some of them, okay? Are you gonna learn them all? Well, nobody knows them all, but I've spent years teaching marine biology and leading hikes, and uh, it's taken me some time to learn most of them. I get stumped every now and again though. So, you know, nobody knows them all that I know of, but uh, my goal is for you to learn 10 of the local shells. And that's easy, 10. So basically you're gonna want to set up a field guide similar to the guides I walked you through. Uh, I would like your, project to be worthy of 
publication and not by that I don't mean uh, the scientific field guide to be used in classes, but something like this with a nice cover, an introduction, a picture of each organism with its description, and then at the end, a proper works cited page. So you're going to have your cover, your introduction, the field guide part with the image, the common name, the scientific name, where you found it, grass flats, deep water, mud flats, where it lives. And then any other important information, like the, uh, you know, a fun fact or two, maybe. Uh, I recommend two specimens per page. Uh, five of them need to be bivalve and five of them need to be univalve. So you would want to arrange them as, as such. So your introduction, you're gonna discuss what a bivalve is, two part shell, clams, oysters, mussels, and then a univalve, uni, one, one shell, those are your snails. So five local bivalves, five local snails. You're gonna describe what a bivalve is, univalve is in the intro, introduction, maybe a little general anatomy or life history of the bivalves, like our common shell. You don't necessarily have to use this, but our common shell guide has the anatomy of the shells. Then it should be at least three paragraphs long, one as an introduction, a paragraph discussing bivalves, a paragraph discussing gastropods. It can be longer. Okay, this is important aspect, so don't gloss it over. Then you should have 10 common local shells, five of each type. I, I, you know, how you set it up is how you set it up, but I showed you a few examples. You're gonna want a high quality image. If you take it yourself, that's amazing. If you go to the internet and pull it off, that's fine, not quite as amazing. If you go to the internet and pull it off, you're going to have to cite that because it's not your own work. So any image you get off the internet, you have to include an entry in your bibliography, your works cited page, because it's not yours. It's only fair. Uh, any images you use, like that picture of the shells that I showed you, use that in your works cited page because you're submitted and as your work, images will be cited. Then you turn in your works cited page as well. So you make it a word file, cover, next page, introduction, maybe a page, maybe two pages, next field guide, five organisms, bivalve, five organisms, univalve. When you're done with that, work cited at the end, okay? And that is due next Wednesday, next Wednesday. Uh, may I ask, uh, there we, we talk about five shells and five snails. Well, a bivalve shell is two-part shell. The ah. A snail is one part, so it's 10 total. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I and understand. then five. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, there's going to be 10 total organisms represented in this. I could have picked anything, you know, and in the past I've gone with sharks and fit, but people are all over the map. Uh, so I figured uh, shells might be a, a good one in case you want to go to the beach this weekend and take some pictures uh, and use those. Uh, that that's, um, that's great. I mean, I would certainly be more than happy if you did that. You can find field guides to our area and shells online, you could Google uh, Tampa Bay area shells, shells at Fort DeSoto, and there's images and everything's beautifully identified and stuff. So you can find your own shells and identify them as well. In a live class, we may uh, do something like that, but this is all on, on the computer. So um, images are, are all we, we turn in. But uh, that's uh, this week's major assignment due Wednesday. 
You also have a discussion forum due next Wednesday. That discussion forum is on dead zones, dead zones. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. What the heck is a dead zone? Uh, it's a area that is eutrophic. Now, nutrient pollution leads to algal blooms. You've all heard of the red tide. That's algal blooms as well. Uh, these algal blooms, the algae dies. And when the algae dies, it decays. As it decays, the bacteria that's decaying it uses up all the water and that area becomes hypoxic, low in oxygen. So nothing can live there. And that's a dead zone. Reduced biodiversity due to nutrient pollution and hypoxic conditions. Very, very common because we farm, the Gulf of Mexico has one of the largest dead zones in the world. The Mississippi drains all of that nutrients into the Delta area, washes out to the Gulf. We have huge dead zones out in the Gulf of Mexico. So this uh, is about those hypoxic zones. Now do this week, if you do recall, you have your virtual field trip to Boyd Hill and its hydrology. That is due Wednesday. And I look very much forward to seeing those projects. Now, as I mentioned, we're entering a new unit, marine biology. There's our friend, the white shark. And the white shark is breaching. Oh gosh, I have an interesting story. When I was a, uh, a diver, and I was, I was a rookie diver, I was green, 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 and I went to the Bahamas on a shark rodeo. Uh, that's where you feed shark and uh, photograph them feeding. Uh, so we all jump in. And goodness, I don't think I had maybe five dives under my belt. So I was like a rookie. And it was a very stormy day and the boat was rocking, rocking. People are jumping in. And of course, I was scared because I was just getting ready to jump in to uh, a feeding frenzy. What the, uh, what the company does is they, they have a chumsicle, which is a 50-gallon uh, bucket full of guts. And they freeze that, you know, because, uh, you know, there's a fisheries nearby. They, they clean the fish and throw, throw the, the dead fish uh, parts in a bucket and they freeze it. And then the dive company buys it and they throw it overboard. And there's a big rope with a bucket. And as the water melts, all the fit, dead fish float around. And we photograph the sharks, the reef sharks that come in. It's a whole diverse uh, amount of different types of sharks coming and feeding of all different sizes. The sharks are pretty much conditioned because they do this a couple times a week. They show up. So here I am, kind of a rookie diver, rocky seas, jump in. And as I jump, a wave hit, and I kind of slipped and hit myself, falling in, kind of fell and didn't do a good giant stride. And I, I'm going down, and below me is a very large reef shark chomping on a, a fish and I go <gasps> and kind of big breath and of course air fills my lungs I float to the top and I'm on the top like a cork floating and I'm bleeding because as I you know jumped off I hit my legs on the uh thing so here I am a bloody guy on top of the surface with all these sharks feeding around me uh why am I telling you this? Because uh, some of the sharks there were spinners. Spinning sharks jump, they're type of black tip, they jump and they spin in midair and then they land. So I'm there floating around on the surface, uh, hyperventilating, bleeding, sharks feeding around me and then all of a sudden sharks start going airborne around me. It was surreal. It was uh, one of the most fun things I ever did 
scariest thing I uh, might have ever done as well. And uh, so I see sharks breach as they feed. The spinners breach here, the white sharks breaching. This doesn't happen very often where the white sharks beach, uh, breach. They uh, do in South Africa, uh, there's a healthy sea lion population and the ground or the uh, ocean floor slopes up just right. So they follow the contour of the floor and they hit the surface so hard they leave the water. And people uh, go on echo tourism uh, events and photograph these sharks as they're airborne. Uh, it's kind of big business now. And they troll carpet, believe it or not, cut in the shape of a seal, black carpet, uh, as like the lure to make the sharks jump to have people take pictures of them. So this is a picture of a shark jump. And I don't know if that's a real seal or one of those carpet lures. It looks kind of flimsy to me, so it might be a lure. But this is what that happens down in South Africa with the breaching sharks. So it's kind of a long-winded story of uh, about sharks just to uh, discuss our cover photo. But I find uh, it quite fascinating, sharks, uh, and uh, the fact that some people don't even count them as fish because they don't have bones. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. But we'll get to that when we get to classification. Now, the marine environment is uh, divided up into zones. Just a, um, a brief uh, vocab lesson, littoral zone, littoral zone is the area of the ocean where light reaches the bottom. So it's productive because photosynthesis can occur. The neuritic zone is the area over the shelf. So you have littoral, which has tides, light reaching the bottom, neuritic, over the shelf. So it's still shallow, so you still have a lot of photosynthesis. Then you have the oceanic zone, which is over the deep. So you don't have um, light reaching the bottom. Notice the all light reaching the bottom littoral, all light reaching the bottom in neuritic, no light on the bottom past that. And uh, the different zones, euphotic, we talked about light for photosynthesis, dysphotic, light for vision, not enough for photosynthesis, aphotic, no light whatsoever. Uh, the bathyal zone is over the shelf. The abyssal zone is over that basaltic abyssal floor. And hadal is in a trench. Pelagic is over the open ocean. And neuritic is over the shelf. So light can reach the bottom in that neuritic area as well. So that's terminology. If you hear the term pelagic fish, uh, pelagic fish are fish that are able to live in deep water and they generally migrate. Uh, if you hear the word abyssal, the abyssal means deep ocean floor. Uh, so in the littoral zone, light reaches the bottom and you are between the tides. Uh, life tends to layer up in these zones. So you, you get the seaweeds, grazers eating them, Below that, a little better adapted would be kelp. So you tend to get uh, zones or bands of life in these zones, in the littoral zone. The neuritic zone is over the shelf again. Light reaches the bottom. The pelagic zone is over the open ocean. Uh, migratory fish tend to live there, large ones. Uh, we call that the blue water. Bathiel is on that slope going down. And then the abyssal is deep ocean floor. Hadal is the deepest of them all. Uh, a couple of other terms we bat around. The plankton. Plankton and planet comes from the same term. Plankton is Greek for wanderer. The planets wander in the night sky among the stars because we pass them, so they kind of have retrograde motion. That's how planets got their name, planets. The plankton wander on the ocean, ocean currents. They, don't, they can't swim against the currents. They're wandering around the ocean, so they're called plankton. Benthos, benthos uh, they, they live on the bottom. They live on the bottom. A lot of them are stuck to the bottom like coral. Others can crawl like a crab. 
Uh, they're all benthos. And then necton, nectos, necton, swim. Common plankton are phytoplankton, phyto meaning plant. They're photosynthetic. Some red tide there. Here is some silica-based diatom, algae. 80% of the world's oxygen are provided to us by phytoplankton. That makes sense. Most of the world's covered with water. Uh, the rainforests provide a lot of oxygen on land. We know trees, you know, hug a tree, they give you oxygen, that too. But over the water, and water's larger, so greater percentage of oxygen is made by the phytoplankton. So phytoplankton are autotrophic, meaning photosynthetic, and they float. They drift on the tides. Diatoms, dinoflagellates, coccolithophores, and picoplankton are the major groups. We're going to be looking at images of these groups as we move through the lessons this week. Zooplankton, or zooplankton as uh, it's pronounced, they are heterotrophic, meaning they eat. There's two broad categories. Whoops. The holoplankton, they live their life as a plankton. The entire life, they're planktonic. Most organisms are meroplankton. That means they live part of their life as a plankton. The juvenile fish are meroplankton, juvenile octopus. The uh, larvae of coral are all drifting on the current until they settle down or grow into something larger. So larval stages are meroplankton. So here, these are protists, these are foraminifera. They're important animal-like protists. This is where petroleum deposits come from, blooms of these guys. Uh, some other zooplankton, uh, jellyfish, comb jelly, this is a tenophore. Uh, the tenophore, C-T-E-N-O-P-H-O-R-E, tenophores, uh, the comb jellies are cool. They can make their own light, they're luminescent, they attract plankton and they eat the small plankton, but they don't have those stingers. Uh, here, this is a copepod and a krill. These are arthropods, shrimp-like organisms. This guy is called a cyclops because he has one eye. If you ever watch SpongeBob, this is SpongeBob's nemesis plankton. Of course, on SpongeBob, he has little legs and he walks around. So plankton is really a benthin in, sun, in SpongeBob. It's ironic, plankton's not even a plankton because he's not drifting on the currents. He's walking around on the sea. Floor. But this is who uh, the real plankton is. Copepods and the krill, these shrimp-like organisms, live in the Antarctic, and they feed the penguins. They feed the blue whale. Largest organisms in the world eat these guys. So these are the zooplankton. The nopolis, these are little crustaceans. Crabs, lobsters, stuff like that. Their larvae look like this. Small fish, their larva looks like this. This is an anchovy, but generally speaking, they're indistinguishable from other small fish at this point of their lives. They're plankton. They're too small to do anything except drift on the currents. Even bivalves are planktonic in their life cycle. That's how clams, oysters, mussels move. As babies, they use currents to disperse them, like trees use wind to disperse their seeds in many cases. Benthos, benthic means bottom dwelling. Here you got sponges, coral, tube worms. These are, uh, these are tube worms, these feather dusters up top. Uh, they filter the water for plankton straining out small organisms and eating them. The nectin, they can actively swim. You have fish, sharks, skates, rays, octopi, cephalopods uh, here. The, this is all informal classification. Uh, we can classify organisms by where they live, abyssal. We can 
uh, classify them by their lifestyle, plankton, nectin. Biologically, we class them by similar characteristics and genetics, and that is called taxonomy. So taxonomy is the scientific classification of life. The father of modern taxonomy was Carolus Linnaeus. Carolus Linnaeus devised the taxonomical categories that we use today, domain, kingdom, phylum or division, class, order, family, genus, and species. This is like the address of an organism. Scientific names, which you will learn in your uh, field guide, are the genus and the species. Genus, species. In your field guide, you need to either underline or italicize the scientific name. That's how it's done. All these field guides, the scientific names are italicized. The genus, the first title, genus, is capitalized. The second, the species, is lowercase. I point that out because that's proper taxonomy. When I look at your field guides, I'm going to see if you are listening. Because when you put the scientific name, italicized or underlined, capitalized genus, lowercase species. That's how it's done worldwide. In this class, we're looking at two taxonomical domains. Some texts have three. They further break the prokaryotes up, but I don't see the need for that. Uh, marine biology texts are different from oceanography texts. This is uh, definitely going to drive David crazy because uh, always, always different from text to text. You grab a biology text and it's different from an oceanography text and it's different from a geology text. Taxonomy is just in flux. So uh, many different categories. We're going to boil them down and simplify them in this class uh, because it's not a biology class. It's not even a marine biology class. It's a marine biology section in oceanography. So there's two major cell types. The simple ones are called prokaryotes. They have no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles. They're very small, very simple. They'll fit into domain prokaryota, prokaryotes. They include the archaea bacteria and regular eubacteria. So it's a bacterial non-nucleated cell structure. The eukarya are from eukaryotic cells. They are complex, have nuclei, have structures. Current scientific thinking is that the eukarya evolved from colonies of prokaryotes. That's endosymbiotic cellular evolution if you're a bio nerd like I am. The common thread here is the cell. Biologists describe the smallest unit of life as the cell. If you're smaller than a cell, you're not an independent living thing, you're part of a living thing. So the cell is the basis of life. There's two general cell types, uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells, have no nucleus, no nuclear membrane, no internal structures that are membrane bound. They are the bacteria. Prokaryotic cells have organelles. They're generally 10 times bigger than the prokaryotic cells and they're complex. Here's a plant cell with chloroplasts, vacuoles, a nucleus, cell wall, cell membrane containing it, cytoplasm in, in, in there. So uh, a eukaryotic cell is far more complex than 
a prokaryotic cell. Two domains. Currently, we have six kingdoms. There's our two domains. Here's our six kingdoms. When I was in school, we only had three kingdoms. Same amount of organisms on the planet. I'm not that old. Like I said, taxonomy is changing every single, every single day. The, you know, the uh, inclusion of mapping geomes has shuffled the deck as well. Uh, they discovered that some organisms are just the same organism at different parts of the life cycle, and no one ever categorized the entire life cycle. Every deep sea expedition pulls up new and unique life that has to be recategorized. So taxonomy is always, always changing. Currently, we have the bacteria and the archaea. These belong to the prokaryotes. And then we have the protista, the fungi. Mushroom walks into a bar. Bartender looks at the mushroom, says, hey, hey, mushroom, get out. Don't serve your kind here. Don't like you. Mushroom looks up, says, why not? I'm a fungi. All right, I'm waiting, waiting. No one's smiling. Ah, somebody finally smiled. Thanks. I'm smiling. My camera's on though. That's oh, but I can only good. I only got the cameras and one person oh, no. smiled. I'm a fun guy. Come on. Oh. I'm gonna tell that to my sister. She'll love that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I got a million stupid jokes. I <laughs> owning them. This becoming this becoming a teacher has really helped me with stand-up comedy. But uh fun guy. Now, protists are very important in the ocean. We're going to talk about them because, you know, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, the radiolarian, the foraminifera. Sounds like I'm speaking another language because I am. Most of these are in Greek. Uh, the algae. So these organisms are going to be mentioned. The fungi, really the only one that we mentioned in marine biology class and in oceanography are the lichens. Okay, so we're not, the, the ocean is not like full of fungus, just not. The plants, when we do our maritime forest and our hikes, you know, we see the mosses and the ferns and all those flowering plants. But in the ocean, there's really the emergent salt marsh grasses. Oh, yeah, they're in direct contact with the ocean. We have the mangroves, which are actively removing salt. And then Fully underwater, we have our seagrass beds. There's not much else plant-wise, like full-grown plant-wise, that lives in the ocean. Most of the primary production is algal, is protists, either the multi-celled seaweeds or these dinoflagellates and diatoms. And then the animals, we're, you know, we can go hog wild with the animals. There's so many sea creatures. It's uh banamilla. So really, protista, animilla are the major with some contribution by plant. Of course, bacteria and archaea outnumber the entire planet, but they're so small that you know when we're in the field or we're doing field guides or things like that, it's just not practical to learn them more than uh, marine bacteria. Uh, the most common I, I, I encounter are the purple sulfur bacteria. It smells really bad. We see them hiking a lot on the beaches. Uh, Blue-green algae, blue-green bacteria grow. That's about all. We don't really see too much of the bacteria. Uh, so marine bacteria, we have the two kingdoms, the archaea and the bacteria or the eubacteria. Archaea is kind of interesting. There's some right there. That purple sulfur stinks really bad. The archaea are adapted to extreme temperatures, extreme salinities, or anoxic conditions. So they're called extremophiles, loving extreme conditions. Uh, they're generally stinky, don't like the oxygen, die upon oxygen exposure, very, very numerous. 
Uh, we have more of them living in our intestines uh, than there are people on earth. Billions, every one of us, billions and billions of archaea live in our lower intestine. You know, those Activia commercials, eating the yogurt to help your bacterial floral. They're talking about these archaea that live in us. They help us digest our food. When we're gassy, they kind of are responsible for that too. And, uh, you know, archaea. We see them here, that purple sulfur bacteria in tide pools uh, tend to get real smelly. You bacteria, uh, the cyanobacteria are the most important. They form a whole zone in the rocky intertidal area. Uh, they are the blue-green. They used to be called blue-green algae and they were classified in the algae when I was a student, but they are now cyanobacteria classified in the eubacteria now. The protists, slime molds, again, they're not really important, so we can throw out the fungus-like. Plant-like protists are the most important, most important. And then uh, the protozoa are the animal-like protists. Uh, those are the foraminifera and radiolarians that the oil deposits would come from, these animal-like protists. Plant-like protists are all the algae. So the microscopic algae, let's take a look at some of them. Here's diatoms we were talking about. These are centric. They come in different shapes. They have a silica. It's called frustral, but it's like a shell. Uh, we use them a lot, diatomaceous earth and pool filters. Uh, they're even found in toothpaste. Uh, they're little uh, diatom silica scrape off those tartar control. They're very, very common, the diatoms most common algae on the planet. Dinoflagellates, we know them, they, they're bioluminescent. They can make a poison because they cause the red tides. Uh, here's red tide right here. Our red tide is Carina, that's the genus. Brevis, that's the species. The poison they make is called brevitoxin. So whenever we have a red tide bloom, it's Nutrients feeding Carina brevis. Carina brevis blooms, causing the red tide. I know when I get around the red tide, <clears throat> cough a little bit, eyes water, runny nose. It's common, that, that poison, it's what it does. It's a mild neurotoxin. Uh, people with asthma can have asthma attacks. Uh, fish, of course, it gets, they die. The poison kills them. So there's large fish kills, stinks like rotten fish on the beaches. Uh, it's a natural cycle. We exasperate it with um, nutrient spikes from farming. We do eat. So, I mean, we're going to have impact. It, it's, we, we can, it costs a little more money to dispose of things better. Uh, sometimes we're willing to pay it. Sometimes we're not. And when we don't, we pay the price with more red tide than, than usual. But the red tide is going to happen whether we are here or not. It's going to happen to varying degrees because they are natural algal blooms. And that algae is always present in low quantities when there's a big spike in nutrients, especially when the weather cooperates and they get the uh, hours of sunlight they like, big blooms. Eating seafood that is filter feeding, filter feeders, builds up the toxins, you can get sick. One of the diseases you can get is called PSP, paralytic shellfish poisoning. Around here, brevitoxin's mild. You can get sick. Other places where it's more poisonous, the toxic algae, uh, you can go into cardiac arrest. So it can be serious. The large macroscopic algae, division chlorophytas are green, division phaophyta is brown, and division rhodophyta is red. Different pigments. Chlorophyll, chlorophyll and fucoxianthin, chlorophyll and phycoblins. Common green algae in our area, 
ulva or sea lettuce. That's one of the more common ones. There's entromorpha and codium and a whole bunch of different algae. Uh, I took a course called Phycology as a graduate student where all we did was study algae for the entire semester. It was really cool though. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, we, uh, I did some graduate work in the Rocky Intercoastals in the Gulf of Maine on the Isles of Shoals. So we would go out and collect samples off of rocks and seals would be swimming around and, and whales would be offshore. So it was very exciting. I mean, I studied algae, not seals and whales. So I wasn't as cool as the seal and whale folks, but I still got to see it. Uh, Phaophyta, the brown algae. Uh, and our common brown algae that you need to know is the sargassum, which is a species. Sargassum is a species, or a genus. Apologize. So I should italicize that. Be good. Uh, sargassum is a brown seaweed that's common in the Gulf. After storms, it gets tore up and that forms the, the um, sargasso sea weed line. That's where the baby sea turtles live and wahoo and, and various birds and billfish use that. Pelagic organisms over the deep live in these floating mats. On the west coast and north, generally north of Groton, Connecticut, the water's cold enough to support kelp, which is a giant brown algae that is, um, forms huge forests. Next week, we're going to spend some time uh, visiting images from each of these habitats throughout the planet. So we'll learn a little bit about the kelp, kelp forests. The uh, red algae, rhodophyta, they're commonly found in the deepest of the waters. They have a red pigment. This porphyra is also called nori. When it dries out, it turns back. And this is what we use in sushi wraps. Chondrus, kind of cool, chondrus here. This is harvested and it's rich in gel, gelatinous material, carrageens and such. This is what we use in foods uh, like ice cream to keep creamy and gels in foods is uh, in preservatives. So hair gel, hair gel, uh, you know, rub an algae extract in your hair to make it look fancy. Makeup, you know, lipstick would rip your lips off if, if it were hard, but it's got gels added so it goes on nice and smooth. All that stuff comes from algae. Laxatives are made from algae. You know, you, you, may, you may laugh now, but if you ever need one, you'll be happy uh, for algae. Emulsifiers and stabilizers, uh, we use them in toothpaste and pool filters and excess uh, insecticides. So there's big business in farming algae. The animal-like protists are called protozoa. So they, uh, they're animal-like. The first and most common are the foraminifera. These guys have little calcium-based shells, little calcium-based shells. They bloom, they die when they settle, and that's where the oil deposits would come from in the shallow seas. And their counterparts have silica skeletons. They're called radiolarians. The plants, the flowering plants, like I said, we have the seagrasses, the mangroves, and the cord grasses, which are found in the salt marsh. The cord grasses here is Spartina. Here's mangroves seagrasses. Those are the three major categories of marine plant. So there's not much plant going on in the ocean. Now the animals, huh, like I said, we're going to go hog wild with the animals. Here, let's point out periphera. That's a phylum, the sponges. Cnidaria, that's a phylum, corals, Sea anemones, siphonophores, jellyfish. All right, Cnidaria, silent sea, uh, kind of reminds me of a pterodactyl. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? 
because the P is silent. It's because they're extinct. You got to ruin everything, Meanie. I was thinking silent P. Much more juvenile and less scientific because they're extinct. Who said that? I got to make note of whoever said that. Come on, show yourself. Extinct. Hello. Ah, silent P. <laughs> they are extinct, by the way. That's why I can't hear them. Uh, you it's can still funny. I like, yeah, it's fine. It's sad if you're a pterodactyl, though, but you wouldn't know you're extinct, would you? All right. Cyanophores, let's take a look at that term. Those are colonial cnidaria, uh, the most famous member of siphonophores are the Portuguese man of war. So that's like uh, a special category of Nidaria's colonial living. Sea anemones, jellyfish, coral are all Nidaria as well. There's a group not listed that I like to touch on, comb jellies. They used to be members of Nidaria, but uh, since this text was produced in 2007, they got their own category. They're called uh, tenophora with a C as well. Platyomenthes nematodes, they're kind of uh, small groups of worms, but the annelids are a large group of segmented worms. We talk about them. Mollusks, this is what your project's on, the bivalves and the snails called gastropods or univalves, one shell. But you also have chitin, squid, octopus. We're going to run through each phylum and just look at pictures of their representatives and talk a little bit about them. Echinoderms or arthropods, apologize, that's jointy appendage. So on land, it's the insects. In the sea, it's the crustaceans. And a singular living fossil, the uh, horseshoe crab. The echinoderms are spiny skin, sea stars, sea urchins, and then the chordates have a nerve cord. Some are invertebrate, some are vertebrate. So phylum periphera are the sponges. They are filter feeders, pore bearing periphera. They don't get around much except their larva are planktonic and they Broadcast spawn, sperm and egg on full moon, new moon, mixed up, fertilization occurs, larva settles on a bare surface, and then never moves again. Nidaria, ah, Nidaria. They are Medusa. Medusa are the jellyfish with the tentacles pointing down. Polyp are the coral and sea anemones with the tentacles pointing up. So your cnidaria are classified by soft body having a stinging cells, stinging cells. And uh, there's two groups, the polyps pointing up and the medusas pointing down. The tenophora, as I said, just like our extinct pterodactyls, silent C though, Set of silent P. We call them comb jellies because they have feeding combs, not stingers. And they actually uh, attract little plankton in the evening by uh, creating a little shimmering light. Flatworms, like the platyhelminthes, are generally parasitic. Roundworms, nematodes, on land, interesting, interesting about our nematodes on land. Uh, so Spanish, Spanish love when they colonized back in the day, what they did was they loved to release uh, game and plant plants that they were used to, because then it made the place more familiar and they knew how to get food. So they brought over a lot of animals and plants, uh, the citrus being one of them. Now, Florida has nematodes in the soil. So the only citrus that survived were the bitter citrus, uh, the sweet citrus that we like and that Valencia is famous for. They all died and only the bitter ones lived because the nematodes didn't like the bitter taste of the roots. So they, they attacked the roots of the sweet citrus and the citrus died. 
So what has to be done, all the citrus that grows in the wild, and there is a bunch of wild citrus when you hike, is all bitter root. So you don't want to pick it and eat it. The cultivated citrus is sweet. They're all graft. They're, they're sweet plant grafted on bitter root. So the roots can survive the nematodes. Because nematodes are roundworts. Some are parasitic. Some are free living. They live in the guts of mammals and birds, the pinworms and things like that, and, and, and things like that. So uh, nematodes have an interesting history in Florida. The annelids are what we look at. There's your Christmas tree worms and your clam worms and sand worms, leeches on land and earthworms. Uh, but they're the first organisms to have what we call a uh, salome. That's biology uh, for a body cavity. So they have organs, a full body cavity uh, and such. These simple organisms don't have internal organs like that. Mollusks are the most common of the intertidal shell. That's why we are looking at the two most common groups of mollusks in our field guide. The first group not in the field guide are these guys, chitons. You don't have to memorize the term polyplacophora unless you're in marine biology, but that's what they are. They're cool. I see them in the keys all the time, sometimes here. Uh, they're segmented. They're like the missing link between mollusks and annelids. Uh, the plesipod means hatchet foot. Uh, they're also called the bivalves. Bivalve, two-part shell. This is one of the groups you look at. This guy is a bivalve, two-part shell. That is a base scallop. Base scallop is a bivalve. The gastropod, which is snails or sea slugs, the sea slugs have no shell, but the snail is the univalve that you're going to find five of, if I could smell. Not smell. Spell snail, right? Snail is the univalve. Uh, we have whelks, Welks with a W. We have conks with a C. Uh, we're going to learn a bunch of the snails next week when we uh, learn about seagrass beds and things like that. Uh, it's kind of fun. You'll see. The head foot, the cephalopods, have tentacles on, on their head. The octopus, the squid, and then this guy, <coughs> the Nautilus. The Nautilus is a member of gr a group of uh, cephalopods that used to dominate the ocean. Uh, back in the time of dinosaurs, uh, they went mass extinct, or actually before dinosaurs, they, they were uh, most common uh, right around that K or the uh, PT extinction, the PT boundary, uh, the mass dying at the end of the Permian, where the Paleozoic uh, era. Uh, uh, turn to the Mesozoic. They are super dominant in our fossil records. This guy, though, Arctucus, or the Kraken, if you will, uh, this is the first photographs of the Kraken ever living. They uh, were always washed up ashore dead. Uh, we found parts, uh, the big beaks and things like that. They were the legends of sea monsters attacking vessels. They could have attacked ships. Uh, basically, the sperm whale eat them, so they uh, attack sperm whales when uh, they see them because they want to drive them off so they don't get eaten. Uh, so a ship could have been going, and a Arctucus could have attacked it, trying to drive it off, mistaking it for a sperm whale. But they're the giant squid. These are the first pictures of actual living giant squid. There's a species, Arctucus. Uh, the arthropods, here's that living fossil, the horseshoe crab. They actually have a copper-based blood that's blue. But the crustaceans are the most numerous and diverse category of animals in the sea. 
The echinoderms include the sea stars and sea feathers and brittle stars, urchins. They are the most uh, spiny, they're spiny skinned. <clears throat> and of course, chordates. These are the invertebrate chordates. This is kind of cool. This is sea pork. It's a tunicate, it's a filter feeder. Here's a pretty tunicate from the Caribbean, their relatives. The larva of the tunicate resembles a fish, but when they settle down, they don't look anything like a fish. They dissolve away their uh, nerve cords and nodal cords and filter. So in our area, we get this sea pork and in reefs, they can be pretty. Now the groups of marine vertebrates, Agnatha are the jawless fish, Chondrichthys are the cartilaginous fish, and Osteichthys are the bony fish. Amphibs, amphibia, amphibians, do, do not tolerate salinity well. There's only a couple frogs in Asia that tolerate about 28, per, uh, 28 parts per thousand. That should be not percent, but that should be parts per thousand uh, salinity, which is brackish, but not even brackish what we're used to here. Reptiles, four groups, the crocodiles, sea snakes, marine iguanas, and sea turtles. The birds, aves, aviation comes from that term, ave. And then mammals, the whales, the cetaceans, the dolphins, the sirena, sirena from the term siren, uh, which were the mermaids, which weren't really pretty in the original mermaid stories. And the term siren woo, comes from that as well. Uh, they would sing uh, and trick sailors to their death. And they would sing beautiful songs attracting these sailors uh, towards them and then lure them to their deaths on jagged rocks and stones and rough seas. So they were real uh, mean. They were mean back in the days. But the Sirena order are the manatees and the dugongs. Uh, I guess uh, drunken sailors mistook them for beautiful merwomen back when they uh, landed here in the, the New World. I don't know. And then order carnivora. So let's do a little show and tell. Here's a jawless fish called the lamprey, no bottom jaw. They attach and drain blood or other body fluids from their quarry. Parasitic, this guy. The chondrichthys are cartilaginous fish. So the sharks, the skates, which lay eggs, and the rays, which give live birth, are all chondrichthys. Osteichthys are the bony fish, most common species of vertebrate. Over 20,000 living, the word extant means living, species. The reptiles, you have your saltwater crocodiles, which can measure up to 30 feet in length, the sea snakes, which are descendants of cobra, they have venom. We don't have any living in the Atlantic. They're more of an Indian Ocean species. And marine iguanas are found on the Galapagos Islands. They evolved from Ecuadorian stock, the tree iguana of Ecuador. Uh, they have been observed trees during storms washing off and getting caught in ocean currents and these castaways uh, of iguanas live on islands and they eat algae. So they've adapted their diets and their uh, salt regulation by um, their nasal glands. And then of course, sea turtles. So these are all marine reptiles. The big claim to fame for a reptile is the amniotic egg. They're uh, able to, uh, they were able to colonize land. The marine birds, the ones that live in the water, like penguins, gulls, pelicans, but we also have a lot of shorebirds, like the egrets and uh, the cormorants and stuff like that, that um, are dependent on the ocean as well. 
and the marine mammals. Lastly, the cetaceans, the porpoises, dolphins, and whales, the carnivores, seals, sea lions, walruses, and sea otters, and sirena, the manatees and the dugongs. Now today, we were just going through basic taxonomy. Next week, we're gonna have a little fun uh, and take look at pictures from each group and learn a little bit about their life history. Now, I'm not gonna test you hardcore on the pictures and life history of all the organisms. It's gonna be more of a fun, informative uh, lesson as we, we go through uh, things. We will have to know general taxonomy and a lot of the terms covered today, which will, of course will be in your review. And, and uh, you know we'll discuss that toward the end of the marine biology unit. But today was more of a classification of marine life uh, lesson. On Wednesday, we're gonna look at marine ecology. So we're gonna look at food chains, food webs, energy transfer, population studies, uh, spatial, distribution in the marine environment, things along those lines, ecological concepts. Next week, we're gonna go ecosystem by ecosystem and look at various organisms. So that brings today's lesson to a conclusion. I hope that you enjoy marine biology as much as I do, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, have a great day. You have a great day as well. Have a good day. Have a good one. Have a good one. It's a pleasure. Yes.